Hello, everybody. Sorry. <laughs> Welcome to the Armory Show and to Armory Live. It's my pleasure to introduce the first talk of today, Biennials, Then and Now. The number of biennials has grown exponentially in the last quarter century, with some 300 taking place in 2018 alone. As they continue to proliferate, we ask how has their relevancy and influence shifted, and what role can their unique multinationalism play in today's geopolitical climate? Guiding this discussion is Sally Talent, who is the incoming director to the Queen's Museum and the vice president of the International Biennial Association. She will bring her own expertise directing the Liverpool Biennial to guide this panel's investigation into the relevancy of biennials today. There will be a short period of time at the end for some questions and answers, but in the meantime, please welcome Sally and the rest of the panelists. Thank you, Julia, and uh, thank you to the team at the Army for the invitation to have this conversation. Um, so I, wanna, I would just want to start by just answering one question that always happens, that, that um, biennial people find a bit annoying. <laughs> or at least, well, I can only say I do, which is people always say, like, what's the relevance of the biennial anymore? And I just think, oh, what's the relevance of the exhibition format anymore? Like, what's the relevance of the museum? It's the same. And so from my perspective, I think... Um, uh, you can do really interesting exhibitions, you can do really interesting biennials, you can have really great museums, but it's reliant on the people and the content and the artists. So from, I think it's more interesting for us to think about, you know, what, what do biennials offer as a platform for artists, for curators, for publics? Because um, they do unfold uh, different sets of possibilities and different points of entry than perhaps uh, simply museum shows do. Um, I mean, I don't know, like I think we, we get asked that a lot, don't we? Yeah. So um, I'm not, a, I've left the biennial field now, but not really because we have uh, the Queen's International at Queen's, which is also a biennial exhibition. Um, I'm um, really delighted that the um, panelists agreed to uh, be part of a conversation today because I think between us we represent very different experiences and positions. So uh, Ryan Gander, who is an artist and who um, has, um, who I had the privilege of working with in the last uh, Liverpool Biennial on a very long project, but who has also taken part in lots of biennials across the world. So I think has a really fantastic knowledge of uh, different kinds of biennials, different sets or, or models of biennials and what the possibilities might be for artists. And um, he, uh, he, may, he, he has a work actually here in the armory that you may have seen on the way in, um, the big blue sculpture. And um, uh, he's going to be spending some time uh, here in New York because he's just been appointed as the Hodder Fellow at Princeton uh, University. So, and you'll be here next year, is that right? Yeah, a little bit. Um, then also um, Candice Hopkins, who uh, is the senior curator of Toronto's first biennial. It's very exciting. I think that Toronto uh, is starting its first biennial and it opens on the 21st of September, is that right? Yeah, and um, it's a city-wide biennial, and I think that um, we have, like the Liverpool Biennial and Toronto, and actually also Istanbul, share that model of trying to introduce people not only to uh, international contemporary artists working in, in a particular situation, but they actually also want to uncover and draw from the narratives prompted by a specific, the specificities and histories of a city context. Um, something that I would describe as a um, situated curatorial practice. So it's not about that place, but it comes from that place. And it invites audiences to not only engage with contemporary art, but also to... Um, to discover something about where they are. And it necessitates a visit, uh, rather than it being something that you could see anywhere else in the world. I mean, there are many biennials that actually take place in museums. You have those here, the Whitney Biennial, 
Carnegie International. There's also the Taipei Biennial. So there are different models, but I think uh, we're going to talk about, about that model here. Um, and Candice has had the uh, opportunity to also work on, uh, is currently working on the Canadian Pavilion of the uh, Venice Biennale, um, where she's um, working together with Isuma um, Collective and um, uh, also worked uh, at Site Santa Fe uh, and on the Documenta 14 team. And I was interested in your experience because um, both Site Santa Fe and Toronto are taking the approach of having the same curatorial team for two editions, which is interesting. Many of us, uh, many people are interested in the continuity between biennials, and there is a lot of discussion about how do you build up and accumulate content and not just... Uh, arrive in a city. And actually, the truth is that is how everybody works, because two years is no time, as we know, to commission a lot of work. And most biennials are perennial in the way that they unfold. Um, and then Biga Ora, who is um, the um, director of the uh, Istanbul Biennial, where she, I was just asking her how many she's done in the edition that's about to open in September, on September the 10th. Um, is, the, is the ninth biennial that's been under your leadership which is uh, amazing. And I think the reason I thought it would be amazing to have Bigger here is that I think um, she brings in an incredible experience and has done an extraordinary job in a very challenging political context to create a biennial that is revered and respected worldwide and, have, and has managed to, I think, reintroduce people to what's possible in Istanbul by working with amazing curators. I think I see one there. Um, and artists and um, people who, who've, who've been able to uh, look at using sites like the um, cistern or some of the buildings that, that, that tell particular stories, but also to challenge the kind of pervasive, negative na na and reductive narratives of, uh, that, that are often deployed in the press. And so I, um, I was very excited to hear a little bit about what's going to happen in Istanbul, Istanbul this year, but also a little more about um, how it's been to evolve a model in that specific, very specific context. Um, okay, so um, I'm not going to kind of read through all the bios because I think that's a, a better way to, to do it. So the questions we've been thinking about really are like um, kind of what... What do biennials offer artists and curators in terms of uh, models for exhibition making? Um, what does the connection between place and the experience of making and viewing art in situ uh, open up in terms of possibilities for making and engaging with art? And as biennials are contextual and in often and mostly international, do they provide a platform for political conversations that are are and can be challenging. Uh, they're often a site, actually, of um, uh, political debate uh, and local um, frictions, and I think that's a real um, gift that, by, that, that, that we have in biennials because they're in a very, very public f format, and they're a format that people feel incredible ownership of. So um, you, you do find that there's an awful lot of feedback, maybe a little bit more than you get when you do a museum show which is uh, interesting and amazing and uh, an education for all of us working in that field. So I'm going to start, actually, with you, Ryan. Uh, artist first and all that. Oh, we're moving away. Moving away from... <laughs> um, where's the, is, you've, like got the, gonna, have you've got the clicker. It's like I'm going to perform. Need some yeah. space. So it, everyone's prepared a kind of short presentation, and then we'll have some questions at the end, and you'll have an opportunity to ask questions yourselves. There's a huge clock here pointing up at us, which is ticking away, which is terrifying. I wasn't even looking at it. Uh, it's interesting that there's a clock here because I think if we think about biennials in the ecosystem of art, I think they have a great relation to time. I'm not probably going to... Do you want me to talk about art or, or just talk about biennials? Just do what you Freestyle. So, um, yeah, in the ecosystem, there's this thing called attention economy. Has anyone heard of it? There's a guy called James Williams who founded Google with some other people. Uh, and he left Google. I interviewed him in Edinburgh a few weeks ago. And he left Google because um, he was terrified. 
by Attention Economy. And he started a charity with some other people called Time Well Spent, which helps you, uh, <laughs> which helps you get over phone addictions uh, and understand that you need to spend your time well, which you are all doing because you're not looking at your phones, you're sitting in a talk. <laughs> so there's one point already. <laughs> Tick. You're all great. Um, and I think when we, yeah, so essentially, attention economy, we, we, when we think about value and we think about economics, we think about worth, we think about currency and wealth, we think about time. Time is money, that old saying. But we've started to realize now that attention is actually time and attention is actually money. Um, which, with the clock's on 40 minutes and 23 seconds, tick tock, see? Um, and the way that that fits with biennials, I think, is they work, biennials function in a greater ecosystem of the art world. And they can't, I don't think they can exist separately. For me personally, I wouldn't be able to do biennials if it wasn't for the commercial art world, because I wouldn't be able to produce the ambitious projects with just the funding public funding from biennials. You know, I have to have feed the studio to be able to practice. and that, So it's a big ecosystem. Um, but the thing that differentiates biennials, I'd say, from all these other parts of this ecosystem is the fact that we give prolonged attention at biennials. Because we go there, usually, unless we're the, the spectators that live in the city, we usually go there like a touring caravan. And when we're there, we concentrate on that. Um, there's no distractions. The way that Instagram is a massive distraction, and it's dividing the art world into uh, two parts, uh, I'd say, an art world that is retinal, your eyes, and an art world that is cognitive, your brain. Because cognitive art doesn't work on Instagram. It works in reality. And you're seeing more and more spectators not going to exhibitions and not going to galleries because they've seen a picture of it. But you understand nothing about conceptual art or con most contemporary art from an image. That's just, the image is just the vessel or the byproduct or the receipt of the idea. And you don't get the idea from an image. So, uh, ranting now, getting very political and angry. I should go back actually. This is what Sally commissioned. It's, uh, there's a huge Catholic cathedral that's very constructivist, modernist uh, aesthetics behind. And I produced a load of benches with school children um, by dissecting the cathedral and making building blocks, which then they composed uh, these sculptural forms that acted as benches that were surrounded by the cathedral. I think the other thing about biennials from an artist's perspective is I really value them because they're a bit like school trips with your friends. And I live in the countryside, not in a big city. So if it wasn't for biennials, I wouldn't get to talk to my friends. And it's great because I would have to go to Berlin to see one friend and New York to see another. And we all meet in Okayama, which is great. It's very economical for us. Um, so this is uh, the Okayama Art Summit. This is in Sydney. Just go through the pictures. They're just pictures. <laughs> uh, this is Documenta in the forest. This is also Documenta. Um, this is an interesting work in relation to what I've just said because, you know, all artists get sort of... Um, every artist has a work that they're remembered for that they will never escape. And I think unless I, there might be another one that I'm remembered for, but I guess this is the one that everyone talks about a lot. And it's interesting because it photographs so badly. <laughs> so if this was a social media post, it would probably get two likes by people that just like space. Um, but the, the actuality of the work is, it's called the invisible pull. Um, and the way that it functions is a spectator visits the museum, the museum is empty. Uh, and they think that the work is about absence and da-da-da-da-da, there's nothing there. And then they start to feel a little bit cold. And they see other people with coats on. They go to the plaque and they read that the work is actually two massive turbines built in rooms 
outside the back of the museum that draw air through the museum, creating a slight breeze which runs throughout the museum. And I think the work functions. This is why you, this would never work as an image, because the work functions when you're there in that moment between thinking there is nothing there and the moment between reading the plaque and realizing that even though that you're schooled in visual language and semiotics, you didn't realize you missed something. That's, that's the magic bit in a way. So anyway, I'll, that's it. Thanks. I can see, yes. We are, we're at 35, 32. One. Zero. Zero, 29. Um, I'm glad you brought up these points because it's a way that I wanted to start. Um, I wanted to begin by talking about an experience, in fact, that isn't included in any of the images. And that was an experience that um, I helped facilitate as part of Documenta 14 for students from the Kunsthochschule, which is the art school in Kassel, and the Athens School of Fine Arts, which is in Athens, Greece. And that was in the summer before the exhibition opened. Um, so almost one year before it opened in April of 2017 in Athens. And that was called the School of Listening. And part of the reason, I think part of the impetus for starting the School of Listening was, I think, in part in response to this idea of the attention economy, to also try to create a kind of radical disjuncture between all of the capital that's put on what we can see and instead think about uh, what we can or cannot hear. And as part of the School of Listening, which took place over two weeks, and it was done in collaboration between uh, Claire Butcher, who was a programmer in Anne Education, and myself as a curator. We learned from and with and together, and in some cases summoned, uh, composers, artists, architects, historians, scientists. And one of the first things that we did, one of the first activities, was um, to perform collectively a score by the late Pauline Oliveros, who's well known for her work into deep listening. And that score is called Dissolve Your Earplugs. And it's not how it sounds, in fact. So it's a series of, it's a text score. So as you read the text score, and we did it all aloud, by the end of the text score, you realize that what she's doing is she's paring away all of these things that we kind of filter out because we think that they're a distraction and that include, could include the noise of the street. It could include the hum of the HVAC system that they've turned off deliberately for our talk. So by the end of this talk, we'll all feel a lot colder. Um, it could be the sound of birds, for example. But by the end, the final line of that score is, she asks us, after we've done all of that, if we can now hear the world as music. And I thought that that was such a beautiful prompt um, by an incredible thinker and a composer, and also a prompt for us to start uh, Documenta 14, and meaning us, I meant those cohorts of students, other learners like I was, and other artists that I worked with at the time. Um, I've spent my career, of which it's now 20 years, working with um, artists who you could say uh, exist in some cases on the margins. Um, so that includes women artists at the either very early or rather late stages of their careers, like someone like Agnes Dennis, who's amazing and now is going to have a, a major solo exhibition at The Shed, uh, working with artists of color, and also particularly um, indigenous artists as well. And I like to use these opportunities like Documenta to give, um, provide, I think, a platform um, because biennials are also an economic model, um, but they can also enable certain artists to produce things on a scale that perhaps they haven't been able to realize before. Um, this is one of those examples, uh, work hand-carved from a single piece of marble from the same mountain that provided the marbles for the Parthenon by Rebecca Belmore. And when you were inside this marble tent that has become a kind of monument to 
the permanence of the emergency, let's say, that uh, is um, the emergency of refugeeism and migrancy, you look out to what is a symbol of Western democracy for us. I also worked really closely with an amazing artist named Bo Dick, who um, sadly passed away four days before the opening of his work in Athens, Greece, um, which was very difficult because like many great artists, you know, he spent most of his career um, struggling. And so he lived uh, some of his life even on the street. And that meant that when he got sick, he got really sick because his body started failing. But Bo Dick was um, a leader in his community. He was born in King Kim Inlet uh, and then um, adopted a nearby community of Alert Bay where he became um, a cultural leader. And what I was interested in working with Bo was actually thinking about economies. Um, Bo is an artist who was deeply engaged with economic systems, and you could say kind of, you could call them alternative economic systems. So thinking about what economy means on the West Coast even now from a person who was deeply involved with the potlatch system. And then also someone like Yura Nongo, who uh, was trained as an architect, works mainly as an artist now, who was really interested in, at that point in time, what kinds of materials start to stand in for currency in moments of economic crisis. So he uh, worked for th almost five months in a scrapyard on the outskirts of Athens in a neighborhood called Elionis, which is quite a famous trading neighborhood um, for different kinds of goods. But he also brought a lot of things with him in his 1986 red Mercedes Sprinter van that he drove all the way from Tromsø, Norway, down to Athens on the periphery of Europe and gathering a lot of collaborators on the way, many of which he had never met yet until he showed up on their doorstep. So this was quite an extraordinary work. Um, what I want to say about it, though, and what I want to say about uh, some of the artists that I included and worked with together with Documenta 14 is that their work also exposed certain intolerances within European society and within European criticism. And I think this is something serious to talk about as well. Um, and I had a good conversation with this, about this with um, a great uh, thinker named Julia Bryan Wilson in Athens. And she said, well, you know, sometimes people come to these events because they want to have their pre-existing knowledge uh, validated. And if what they see a lot of times does not fit into that pre-existing knowledge, they can actually uh, lash out in different ways. Um, so Documenta 14 did receive a great amount of hate mail. Some of that was on the front pages of many national newspapers around the world. Some of it came in private letters, um, and some of it was rather aggressive. But one of the ones that was, has always stuck with me was a critic who was working temporarily with um, Suddeutsch uh, Zeitung. Her name is Kia Valland. And uh, the first headline that she wrote in response to Documenta in Athens is, it was a question, and it was called The Reindeer Dilemma, uh, kind of like a tongue-in-cheek jab at uh, Sami artists. Um, but then they quickly changed the headline to Ethnic Purity as Art which I thought was pretty profound because no one was talking about that, in fact. Um, but what I thought it was interesting is, is that it kind of provided a bit of a bellwether to um, what was considered to be within the canon of European art history and what would be tolerated as part of the future canon of Euro European art history and, um, and what was gonna be afforded a little bit of space afterwards. And one of the artists afforded a little bit of space afterwards is this artist, Britta Marakatlaba, who is an artist who's been working in Sápmi in Sweden her entire career. And we were so honored to show this work, which is a 24 meter long tapestry um, that's also called the Reindeer Tapestry that is a stitched history of Sápmi. So I'll end there and we can talk more about Toronto after. So thank you. So um, I would like to apologize, first of all, for my voice, because um, I lost it a little bit, but I hope you can still understand um, 
what I will talk about. So, um, working in the field of the biennial in the last 15 years, I believe the format of a biennial must be specific to the context it's being held, taking into consideration the necessities of the local art scene and being visionary about alternative features. <clears throat> the Istanbul Biennial is primarily a space of art, fundamental and experimental platform for the production, dissemination, and discussion of contemporary art, a curatorial and artistic endeavor. It's a critical site for experimentation, debate, and learning. It's, of course, a public and civic manifestation. It's a meeting point for people, ideas, and textures. It offers It offers the widespread expansion of our understanding of the multiplicity of arts histories. Um, so the Istanbul Biennial X uh, is an RP Lego, which is composed of multiple stories by artists from all around the world. Since the beginning, it acted as a temporary museum, a museum without walls, which would move from one place to another. In a way, the lack of infrastructure in the city probably made us even braver and more creative in terms of finding alternative spaces that could be then transformed to exhibition spaces. Um, and we mostly followed the paths of the artist. And together, we were able to create works in the public space and indoors, we, uh, which could find their entry point with the public. So the work of Doris Salcedo, presenting the topography of war embedded in everyday life, was one of, uh, was one of the great examples of the 8th Istanbul Biennial in 2003, which was my first biennial. And throughout the years, uh, we have worked around 100 spaces in the city, from old shipyards to small hotel rooms, from boats to old schools, and proved that all these spaces could be used for exhibition spaces and for public use. And the artists engage with all these non-conventional spaces and produce works responding to the dynamics um, of these locations. Aisha Ekman was one of the artists who has signaled the upcoming demolition of the Antrepo buildings, which have been home to the biennial since 1995, through a green wrecking ball swinging from a crane. In these 30 years, I believe we have presented a wide variety of curatorial methodologies, offering a space of new debates, paradigms, and forms, acting as a place of interaction, meeting point, debate, and working in non-conventional spaces in the city and engaging with the local context and the international art world. So the biennial acted as a space to produce and present new definitions of artistic production and share artistic and intellectual knowledge. Our long-term friendship with artists and other participants has been of utmost importance to us. Algren and Draxis is, is one of these artists who have been invited to the Istanbul Biennial in 2001, 2011, and 2013, and followed the transformation of the city and the contemporary art scene. So we had the great pleasure working with them in the previous edition as the curators of the Biennial and challenged the difficult conditions of the local context together. The Biennial acted also as a learning space for many people who have been involved in the realization of the exhibition, its diverse programs and publications. It has been influential in creating a space for criticality, for a space of debate and advocacy. And Inge Evinar, uh, who participated with the co-action device to the Biennial in 2013, she wanted to uh, look for the basic urge to 
uh, to find possibilities of pure fact of being together. So it was a basic uh, reaction to the political turmoil in 2013 in Turkey, aiming a space for resistance. So she brought together a number of participants to think and to produce together, focusing on artistic and performative research and its methodologies. And this year, she's working on the pavilion of Turkey at the Venice Biennale through a mind-blowing installation, which has its roots in this experimental piece. From the beginning, it has been always uh, significant to commission new works for the biennial. So we have been able to produce more than half of the works in the exhibition for the last 10 years. And each time we invite an artist for a new commission, we encourage the artist to work with the local knowledge, which is very important. And uh, we try to assist as much as possible uh, with our core biennial team. And we introduce the artist to the local experts and uh, local people. So after presenting a smaller scale work in 2011, Adrian Villarojas was back in Istanbul to realize a radically moving experience on the seashore of the Trochke House, which was for the first time open to the public through the biennial. And the work was so much inspired by the history of the space and the fantasy of the character Trochke um, who had to leave from Russia to stay secure and live there uh, for a certain period of time. In 2017, uh, Fred Wilson created Afrokosmet, this large-scale exhibition where he was questioning what it means to be black and questioned the difficult history of hidden slavery in Turkey, I mean, in the Ottoman period, basically. And after a long research period, Talking with historians, the black community in Turkey, and many local experts, he collaborated with traditional craftsmen and involved tile makers, miniature painters in this production. And he believes that his experience in Istanbul has brought a new perspective to his established practice. And all these collaborations are invaluable, both for the artists and for the local context, as we learn from each other from an equal perspective. And for the upcoming Istanbul Biennial, which will be held between September to November this year, we are collaborating with Nicola Burio. I'm sure you are familiar uh, with his work, who is an international acclaimed curator, thinker, and writer. And he's now based in Montpellier, and he's the director of three institutions, uh, the Fine Arts Academy, La Panacee, the contemporary art space from the uh, educational, starting with the academy and um, going through to the collection. And um, so the 16th Istanbul Biennial will be titled The Seventh Continent. And this huge mass of waste, seven million tons of floating plastic in the Pacific Ocean, creates this new continent as one of the most visible effects of the Anthropocene, the human age. And the Biennial will be working on the idea of the anthropology of an off-centered world and an archaeology of our time. So I hope you will all join us in Istanbul. And additional to everything I talked about, we think it's really um, even more urgent to invest in local art practitioners and engage with the local community to create spaces of gathering physically and mentally during these challenging times. Two examples would be the study and the research program that we initiated last year. And it's an alternative program which is bringing together 20 artists and people from um, other disciplines for a period of six months and creating a space for dialogue and talks. And the second example is the uh, a learning and interaction space, uh, which will um, create this continuity also between biennials. And uh, so it, uh, it gives us the possibility to run long-term programs for children, for youngsters, for refugees. So for all the dis uh, different disadvantaged groups who have limited access to culture and arts. 
so through all these programs, we make the advocacy of art as a human right, as stated in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So it seems of utmost importance to develop resources, both financially, but more important mentally, for artists and communities to be together and to show solidarity in order to imagine an alternative future. Finally, I would like to conclude with an image of a permanent work of Ugo Rondinoni that we have installed in the last edition. Where do we go from here? And I would like to share with you some questions I have in mind so that we can discuss together. Um, it's a time when social traumas and political earthquakes have increased anx anxieties about the future in an extreme way. Even most basic individual freedoms are being threatened, being witnesses of massive waves of migration, instability of living conditions, rising sentiments of populist nationalism, wars, violence, and anxiety at all levels, xenophobia and populism all around the world. How do arts institutions and biennials deal with this complex situation? And can we think to re-evaluate and uh, re-examine the role of arts institutions and biennials under these circumstances? What can be our strategies and our tactics that we can develop together? And what are some lessons to learn from each other's experiences? I believe within all these parameters, what we do becomes even more urgent and more crucial. And the work of artists, authors, and cultural workers has become even more important and vital than ever. And I think, and I believe, that's how I can continue at least, if we act collectively, if we listen each other, and if we create a new language together, which is different than the language of the mass media and the governments, and if we build up and develop collaborations at the local and international level to avoid the feeling of isolation and uh, to feel st stronger together, the future uh, is ours. Thank you. So, um, I mean, that's very powerful <laughs> to end on that, Vige. I think, um, but I think it's important. And, and one of the things that I've really valued about the time I've had to work together with our colleagues in the biennial sector is that sense of collectivity. So, y you will, there, isn't, there is, I would say, no competition in our field. When somebody tries to start a new biennial, we're all we all try to help because um, biennials tend to happen in, not, not like art fairs happen in primary cities where there's a market. And I think biennials answer a different question about need in the way that um, Bega has begun to articulate very beautifully there. And, um, you know, we have colleagues trying to do biennials in Jogjakarta, in Indonesia, Lumbambashi in the Congo, in Senegal, all over the world. And the important thing is that we try to share the knowledge we have, but also learn from one another in terms of creating new models and new perspectives on the world. And I think, you know, Mon, um, the Toronto Biennial, like, we've all tried, I think, to help you I think it's like we just share what we know in order to help people falling into the same holes. We have our own problems. That's the problem. We all have our own traps. But um, I think maybe it would be nice for you to say a few words about what you're going to do in Toronto, and then we can open up to discuss some of the questions that um, Bigge just raised. Thanks, Sally. And when Sally says that, I think you also under have to understand that you are mo one of the most generous people who works in our field. <laughs> so we're, we're so grateful to be able to work in this way where, you know, those of us who, who are starting biennials, which simply means an exhibition that takes place every two years. And as Sally said, you know, we, we aren't ready to do away with exhibitions yet, so we're not ready to do away with biennials yet. Um, but coming to Toronto was also coming through learning from all of these other um, biennial formats, including um, Site Santa Fe is one, uh, Istanbul is another, uh, Liverpool was also another major precursor for us. 
So Toronto, as a biennial, is taking place along the waterfront. Toronto is a waterfront city, although sometimes it feels like it has its back to the water. And it's on the Great Lakes ecosystem, which are, is the largest freshwater ecosystem in the world. It's also host to some of the biggest salt mines, which I didn't realize until I moved to, back to Canada and moved to Toronto. Um, and it's also host to something that I've been calling lately because I think it's funny, but not everyone thinks it is, fu is as funny as I do, called uh, lake capitalism. So instead of late capitalism, we have lake capitalism. Um, and I think that what this biennial enables us to do, because I'm working on both um, 2019 and 2021 with my co-curator Tyrone Bastien, um, is to commission artists over not just uh, iterations of biennials, but to potentially engage with someone last year who actually wants to make something for 2021, and we can support that. Um, so to try to extend the time frame of biennials, because as we know, biennials are always a kind of race against the clock. And it also enables artists to do projects that are iterative. So they can present one model one year and then work towards presenting something else, perhaps in 2021. And one of the people that we're working with who's doing this is um, Susan Shipley, who was one of the co-founders of Forensic Architecture. And she's looking into, as an extension of her idea of material witnessing, She's looking into ice core archives because her question is, you know, increasingly the environment itself is being called on in the court of law to be a witness to climate change. And ice core archives are in fact things that hold, in some cases, up to 20,000 years of climatic history. But she's also asking another question. And because Canada is also an Arctic nation, she's asking the question of, who, in terms of us, gets called on to also be those witnesses? And honestly, um, because I've spent a great deal of time now in the Arctic and I was born in a subarctic region, it's not the people living there. It's often just the scientists who go there for you know, short periods of time and they make their analysis and then they go home. So when, when a story that I like to tell in relation to that is a story that Inuit, in the Arctic had been telling for a long time. And they had been telling scientists who were tone deaf, and they were saying, you know, the horizon line is changing. The horizon line is actually moving farther out. And then scientists said, well, that's impossible. You know, you're just crazy. You don't know what you're talking about. And then, of course, they learned later that um, the people that were informing them were right. So the horizon line is changing. It's changing because of the atmospheric changes. And those atmospheric changes in the Arctic create a perceptual shift. So it exactly looks like the horizon line is moving farther back. So they were right. Um, so those are some of the questions that we're dealing with. But one of the first things that we did was we commissioned um, Ange Loft, who's a Mohawk artist and musician and a theater director, to write something for us that's called the Indigenous Context Brief. So the Indigenous Context Brief looks at more than 14,000 years of history and also potential futures. And it's a kind of layered cartography of place. And one of the things that really struck me about that brief, and it's something that we share with all artists, and she also meets with artists. She's also working as an artist in the exhibition. And our advisor, um, even though she's much younger than us because she's much wiser, is this story um, of these footprints that were found in the blue clay. So, the Great Lakes ecosystem used to create something called blue clay, um, and it was that. It was a blue color, but because of how much we've polluted the Great Lakes, you know, this blue clay is really hard to find. And the clay itself held, at one point in time, right at the base of the water where Toronto is, is, is now, where the city of Toronto is now built, the footprint of more than 100 people who were leaving the lake. And in true sort of way that we understand sort of Western conceptions of history, someone took note of all these footprints that were kind of fossilized in the clay, and they made it a drawing, and then they covered them over when they were making the city. So these are the kinds of questions that we're, that we're looking at, that we're working with artists together with, and we are commissioning now um, over 20 new works, and we'll be working with about 45 artists over the course of Toronto, and some of those, as I said, will be working in 2019 and 2021. Okay, so we have six minutes, 31 seconds left. Um, I'm going to open up to questions to give you an opportunity to 
feedback, unless, Ryan, did you want to say anything to anything that um, anyone said? Anyone? No, okay. So does somebody have a question? You wait you for the mic. mic. Thank you for such an interesting panel. Uh, it's more a thought, and I'd like to know what your thoughts are. It just seems nowadays there's such a divisive them versus us environment. And I think it's more important than ever that all these things that you're talking about, these issues that are so important, refugees and the ice and the environment, that we bring in the communities and the people to the biennials and make them a part of it. Because if we don't, it'll look like there's all those artsy people, right? And then there's us, and they're talking about us. But we don't get to go see the art. We don't get to be a part of it. So I'm wondering how you think about that. Thank you. I can answer very quickly from my perspective. So we've been thinking about accessibility as broadly as we can right from the beginning. So everything that we do as part of the biennial is free and then also accessible in other ways. Um, and we've created uh, an accessibility strategy to think about um, those questions so that art is the biennial, this biennial at least, doesn't kind of fall into the usual art tendencies, which is to create a lot of different kinds of hierarchies. I can answer from Liverpool Biennial's perspective previous, where, my, where I previously worked. So um, if you're part of this world, where we are right now, you probably would go to the opening of the biennial, which is two days. The biennial's on for 15 weeks. And uh, the people, the professional audience for um, the biennial is 10% uh, of our audience. The other 90% is, is people who are non-arts professionals, who live locally, who uh, work in the city, and who travel to see the biennial from elsewhere in the world. And we have all of those statistics. So we had uh, 1.2 million visits in 2016. We haven't published the figures yet for 2018. And um, only you know a very small percentage of those were our peers. Very important but not the only audience. And I think that most biennials, you will find if, I mean, I, I, go, I, I go to the openings to support my colleagues, but I, I like visiting them outside of the openings because then you feel the reality of, of what, it, what it's like when there's like, you know, people going around and being excited because they're, they are hosting and owning the biennial. I don't know if any of you have been to the Kochi Biennial. It's a really great example of that where like, um, Everybody was wearing T-shirts that say, it's my biennial. I love that. We were all a bit jealous of that, actually, to be honest. But um, they did it first. I mean, um, talking about the biennial, I think it was also an important decision to make the biennial free of charge in 2013 when we were, um, in fact, working on an exhibition which was focusing on public space, on the redefinition of public space. And we had to rethink about the exhibition just three months before. Um, and so it kind of increased also the number of the visitors. I think we, uh, we could, you know, reach it. Um, like we were able to reach like half a million visitors in the last two editions. Um, but uh, additional to that, I mean, this does not, this cannot be the only way of reaching everyone. Of course, uh, so we uh, develop uh, a lot of different programs, for example, to reach refugees, uh, because we in Turkey we have like more than three and a half million Syrian refugees, uh, um, I mean, whom we received in the last five years. And uh, we were always asking ourselves what we could do as the biennial and as art institutions to uh, make maybe the life of newcomers a little bit more like easier and how they could be integrated um, or if we could find you know ways to bring people together in the programs that we created and one of the good examples was um, we uh, we invited some artists to work with you know Syrian artists and Syrian communities but we also did the children's book uh, that we published normally in Turkish and uh, in English. We also uh, published it in, in Arabic. And we were organizing all these workshops where we went to the neighborhoods um, where they live. So we didn't only invite them to the biennial, but we also visited 
uh, you know, the communities in their neighborhoods and organize workshops and introduce this children's book so that they could also come and visit the biennial with their parents and families. I think that's exactly it. Um, we're creating also this idea of co-commissioning and partners and Alana Shamoon, who's in the audience, is our director of programming and a big interest of hers is to think about this gathering place program and also to partner, and Liverpool did this effectively as well, to partner with libraries, to think about where people already are so that it's not just about them coming to we, where we are, but also providing these programs there. Um, I went, when I was really young, I went to Basel to the art fair, the first time I went there. I know art fairs aren't biennials, but it's a good analogy. And I was in the back of a taxi, and I said to the taxi driver, um, there must be lots of people in town, it's really busy. And he said, it's the watch fair next week. <laughs> and there would be double the amount of people. And I think that's really interesting because because we're in the art world, all you, you guys, you're all in the art world. And it's very difficult to have empathy and see the world when you're in it from other outside perspectives. Um, and. I worry, I, I mean, I, the work that I make and the things that I'm involved in are very much about um, being open and being transparent and non-elitist and giving the potential for anybody, whatever they're interested in, if they're not interested in art, they might be interested in what cooking or Formula One racing or watches or whatever it is, but so that the art world's accessible to everyone. But there's part of me, this is a bit like playing devil's advocate, that worries that a lot of people in the art world um, feel act as missionaries because it's not for everyone there'll always be people that don't give a shit about art and that's their prerogative they might like something else and it's not like art is a religion and it will change people and make them better you can either be interested in it or not interested in it so I think that's something that we need to keep in our mind as well that this isn't the center of the world and biennials aren't the center of the world. When you, and we should all look from outside in, I think, you know. We've just hit zero. You can carry on. That was, okay. yeah. Is, is there another question in the audience? I'll bring you the mic. It's for the Istanbul, Istanbul Biennial. Do you get government funding for that? Mm -hmm. Um, the Istanbul Biennial is organized by a non-profit and non-governmental organization. And um, I mean, we um, rarely get public funding. And when we get public funding, it's maybe 2 or 3% of the total budget. And we usually get the news after we have the biennial. But we have a mixed um, funding system where we have uh, companies, private um, sector, individuals, international funding institutions um, supporting the biennial. And I think it's really important to create this, um, you know, group of uh, like maybe more than 200 people and companies coming together to support the biennial. So it's also um, a kind of ownership of the biennial. It's not only one single you know, entity, but everyone who finds different ways to engage with the biennial. So we also create a community around um, the supporting system. Yeah. What time for one more? There's a question here. Oh. Uh, general question for everyone or for those who wish to reply. What are the limitations and advantages of a two-year biennial cycle? <laughs> well, I mean, if we think about maybe artworks and how artists works, like what, like what are the advantages and disadvantages? Um, the time. <laughs> I'm really interested in your Toronto one where there's iterations because when we think about art, we usually, th I think about artworks. You make an artwork, it's in an exhibition. And then when you've got a load of artworks, you make an exhibition 
and the exhibition as an artwork, but we very rarely think about the trajectory of an artist's life and their career, their entire practice as an artwork, and that, that goes towards doing that, I think. I mean, it's not about um, supporting an artist continually, it's about having a different way of making like a masterwork of different pieces, which I've never heard that as an idea before, and I thought it was amazing. Maybe in the future, the, the biennials will only be every 10 years. <laughs> They'll just could, be one a year, be it would be brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. Monster is every 10. Yeah. That's right. yeah. um, I think it is that, that opportunity, but it's also the opportunity, one of the things that we talked about a lot in both, I think, Site Santa Fe, and then um, where I worked over three editions and, and in the formation of Toronto was what artists needed. And you know, maybe they don't need us all the, all that much time, but, <laughs> but one of the things that people came back with a lot was that, you know, biennials as an ecosystem are actually a really horrible place for artists to work within. Because you have to, you know, there's a lot of pressure to come up with a great idea very quickly, and, you know, you have to sort of suspend your life, all the other things that are happening in your life in order to concentrate on this. So we thought a lot about, you know, how can we actually make this even a more sustainable model for artists? And maybe this is one idea, um, and I'm sure that there are others. Um, um, I, think, I think one of the best things about biennials is going back to that attention economy and going back to distraction is that you can make very silent things because they're very quiet places, in fact, in relation to uh, the night all the galleries open in Chelsea or at an art fair, all the booths. There's very little competition so you can make very subtle gestures. You don't need to be bombastic and you don't need to be loud. And, and with that comes really interesting, well-articulated work that you don't get in other areas of the art world, I think. It's like a, a really good sieve for getting rid of all the crap that's shiny. Shiny. <laughs> I, I've lost sight of Julia. I'm here. Where are you? Oh, you're there. Yeah, yeah. You were hiding. Just trying not are, are to we hog now, your limelight. You yeah. Okay. I think. Should we just say that's the end? Yeah. Okay. So um, they will be around if you want to ask them questions. Yeah, we're around. Yeah. But um, you know, you know where we are. I think you can find details of the forthcoming biennials in both Istanbul and in uh, Toronto online, and uh, you can always find out stuff about Ryan. Um, that's true. Uh, so thank you so much for coming today. I do hope to see all of you in Istanbul and in Toronto. And um, thank you so much for a really fascinating conversation. Thank you.